Welcome to Thrombo Watch, the podcast that uncovers the real stories and science behind blood clots. In this episode, we're sharing one man's terrifying experience, a night of partying, a long drive home, and a sudden collapse at the cost of his life. This is a true story. We've changed names and details to protect the identity of the person who shared it. This is Matthew's story. What you need to know to protect yourself and the people you love. Let's get into it. Hello everyone, welcome back. I'm Dr. Aman Sharma, this is Lewis Thompson, and we'll be talking about something very special today. We have asked people to tell us their stories so that we can share them with people. Matthew shared his story with me recently. We talked last time about healthy lifestyles. I'm not sure this comes in the category of healthy lifestyles, but it did really happen, and it's probably happening to other people right now. So, Matthew, similar age to maybe yourself, Dr. Sharma. And he had been an overweight child. But then as he got into his teens, late teens and early 20s, he discovered working out at the gym and he became much more interested in having a healthy physique. Mm -hmm. And that led to him getting a bit of attention from the girls and he was loving life. And he was invited to a party at the other end of the country. And so he drove to this party he partied all night and that partying did involve some illegal drugs and he was on cocaine and alcohol and without commenting on that he had a great time at this party he slept it off the next morning and once he was sober he headed back in the car to travel several hours back home in the car okay and he really wanted to get home He really wanted to, all the things that he'd not done over the weekend, he knew he needed to get on with. So he was focused on getting home. But as he was driving, he started to feel a bit unwell. But that was probably not surprising given his weekend. So he was like, okay, don't feel so well, never mind. Keep going. He got home and he went to get his bag out of the car. And it felt like a ton weight. Okay. Fit and healthy guy. And he picks up his bag that he carried down there, no problem at all. And it now feels like the weight of the world. So he thought, that's a bit odd. I've really overdone it this weekend. Goes into his apartment and it's actually upstairs. So he gets it, opens the front door and he goes up the stairs and he can't breathe as he's going up the stairs. He can't get his breath. So he's quite worried. He sits down and he doesn't feel better. And he actually starts to feel worse and he starts to feel more and more short of breath. And he starts to panic that he's dying. And so he calls an ambulance. And the person, the operator said, can you get the front door open? So he couldn't get back down the stairs to get the front door open, but he pressed the intercom. So the front door was open and he, and they told him to go near the front door, near as he could to the door of his apartment. So he did that. And that's the last thing he remembers until he woke up in hospital. Fortunately, the paramedics found him unconscious and took him to hospital and After some investigations, what they found is that he did have clots in his lungs, like you described last time. If you've got a DVT, for instance, yes, and we're talking about the clot breaking off, how can you experience or what symptoms are you going to experience is what we were talking, right? Again, chest pain, not very specific. It can be right, left. The second one is shortness of breath because a big chunk of your lung is not functioning because of a blood clot there. So again, shortness of breath. You can have dizziness. People have reported dizziness because your blood pressures and everything start to play up a bit. Along with this, very non-specific symptoms, feeling fatigued, not feeling well. And we also take a consideration. We've got various, what to say, scales, Mm -hmm. which we calculate the risk. Okay. So for instance, if someone is having cancer, they're on cancer medications. Someone who's pregnant, someone who's on hormonal replacements and someone who had a previous PE or a DVT. So the risk factor is revolving it. We usually calculate a score. If you're high on the score, we would usually test you and your lungs. We also can do some blood tests, but again, they're not very specific to this. Your ECG, the trace of your heart monitoring, also gives some indications you might have a pulmonary embolism. But regardless... Key take-home point here would be, if you've got a chest pain, shortness of breath, dizziness, something doesn't feel right, as we say, get it checked. It might be a pulmonary embolism. Could that pain be in your back? 
Uh, I'm thinking about the lungs. It goes of front course, to back. because the lungs are just not anteriorly, right? They are throughout our rib cage. So yeah, chest pain anteriorly, posteriorly, laterally, on the sides, on the back. They can be. Last question for now. If you are found to have a pulmonary embolism, what can be done about it? Excellent question. So the treatment of pulmonary embolism has to be in the hospital. You can't treat it at home. You can't treat it at a primary care facility. It has to be a hospital. Okay. Now, depending on how the hemodynamic parameters, as in the blood pressure, respiratory rate, oxygen levels, overall condition of the patient, we decide whether we can use a very strong agent to dissolve the blood clot or should we give them agents which can potentially reduce the blood clot formation. So again, number one treatment would be thrombolysis. Thrombolysis means thrombus needs to cut, dissolve, right? So thrombolysis. The other, as I said, for thrombolysis, people usually are very unstable. Unstable as in blood pressures all over the place, oxygen requirements all over the place. They might be not fully arousable. So it's a very life-threatening condition. We're talking about the pulmonary embolism being this symptomatic because it's going to affect your heart. It's going to affect your lungs. It's going to affect your blood pressures. It's going to affect your blood circulation, your kidneys, your brain, everything. So if that's the case, thrombolysis and maybe admission in the critical care but the most what to say the most amount of people they have pulmonary embolism which is not that symptomatic so we usually start them on a medication which we call as inoxaparin it's a sort of heparin we give those injections in the tummy and basically make them better send them home and they continue the medications depending on further investigation with the hematology department and also if it was provoked or unprovoked so all of these conditions like the dvt and the p if we're talking there's another factor to it if you call us provoked and unprovoked we don't know why it happened provoked again they were on hormonal replacement therapy they had cancer and had risk factors precipitating to it someone flew a 12-hour flight okay it's provoked whereas someone who is sitting in his home watching the football, suddenly felt a chest pain, called the ambulance and found to have a pulmonary embolism. So somebody who had been really fit and healthy, living his best life as he thought at the time, then became this very unwell and very disabled. And he felt, as you talked last time, you said, maybe somebody would think that they have less worse. And he did. He felt that he was unable to go to the gym as he had to. once he was out of hospital he felt that he couldn't exercise in the way that he had he couldn't maintain that physique he wasn't as attractive to the ladies anymore and it he felt that he was putting on weight he wasn't getting out and it spiraled yeah and he became less and less happy and less well so i don't expect you to say that cocaine is a good thing to do no. but on the other hand people do it so what do you take from all of that? So specifically, when we talk about Matthew's case here, a couple of precipitating factors and the risk factors that I would like to highlight. Firstly, we don't know how long did he drove for. Driving a long distance Ow. without any rest in between is not recommended, firstly. If you do it, most of the times now what has happened is because we've got automatic cars. So our left legs are predominantly sitting ideal because it's just the right leg doing most of the job. Again, prolonged period of immobilization and staying in the same place is a risk for developing clots in your legs, the DVT. Now, to add further harmful effects, is the second one is alcohol, because he was drinking. See, we all have done alcohol. It makes us feel good, bad. People have their own experiences. But what it also makes us do is you pee a lot, after you've drank. <laughs> That's very common. And we think, oh, it's the alcohol causing it. But you have to understand the pathophysiology behind this. So the alcohol acts on a few of the kidney receptors, which have a tendency to throw off water and extract the salts out of it. So alcohol in general work as what we call as a diuretic, isn't it? Because you're peeing a lot more, you're drinking alcohol and you're peeing a lot more. So your water content 
is gone significantly low. You're thinking you're drinking. Yes, you might be drinking beer. You might be drinking some mixed juices and stuff. But your water intake has gone low and you're peeing a lot, thereby causing a sort of dehydration state. Do you guys know why you feel the hangover? Why do you have the headache that we call as the hangover? Punishment for having fun. It's but... dehydration. That's why the next morning people get up, they have either paracetamol or aspirin and they drink a lot, drink lots of ca caffeine. Caffeine essentially is stimulating your brain. So the dehydration is the culprit here, which we also know is the culprit if you've got any blood clot disorders. So you had long distance driving, you had booze all night, you drink much enough water, you dehydrated yourself to the core. And to make things worse, you had illicit drugs. Again, I'm not going to say which is better. None of them is better. None of these illegal drugs are better. Okay. They might fee make you feel you're on top of the world, but actual damage they're causing to your body is, you know, what to say, absolutely catastrophic in a way. So cocaine, as people take, cocaine has a very high risk for you to develop a heart attack. You would say I'm joking, right? Cocaine does what? It makes you high and all, but it also causes the blood vessels in your heart to go into spasm. We call it as coronary spasm. You will have a chest pain. Since you've got a spasm now, you might get a blood clot there because it's significantly narrowed suddenly. Once you've got a blood clot in there, you have a heart attack. Okay? And the cocaine caused that heart attack. So, See this chain of the domino effect, the ripple effect here, isn't it? You went to a party, you had too much booze, you had illicit drugs, you drove long, and now you're unwell. You have a clot in your heart, clot in your lungs, clot in your legs. Especially if we talk about in this case specifically. So this gentleman might have clot in their lungs. Yes, precipitating factors, long driving, dehydration, illicit drugs. Is it potentially life-threatening? Yes, it is. Could it have been prevented? Yes, it could have. So, whatever you're doing, you always have to take care of the amounts that you're doing it in. We always say, medications, if you do at a higher dose, it causes an overdose. Similarly, these things in life, if you do excessively, they also cause potential harmful effects. We don't know whether Matthew had any pre-existing hereditary conditions or anything he didn't mention that when he told me his story he may have he may not have maybe not it could have just happened it just could have from just that happened. one weekend yeah. of excess absolutely when we talk about the hereditary conditions they are again a risk factor as i talked in the previous podcasts if someone has a factor five latent deficiency it doesn't mean they have the disease they have the genetic expression, they have the default gene, as you may say. But if you mix that things with all the other provocating factors, you get the disease, which here is the blood clot. Wow. So key message, don't do anything to excess. Don't do illegal drugs. Yeah. Keep, if you're driving, get out and get some exercise. Absolutely. Stop for a drink. Probably not coffee. You may do what you like, guys, but we what we're trying to do is these all things are preventable. That's what we're emphasizing on. Because it's one life. We might get diseases which we've got no control on. But yes, if you get these symptoms, the wisest call is to not sit at home, but you have to go to the hospital if you've got chest pains, if you've got palpitations, shortness of breath dizziness you have history of any family blood clot disorders that's the smartest thing to do matthew was in no doubt that he was close to death in a totally unexpected way and he didn't know what was happening to him he'd not heard of pulmonary embolism yeah. before it happened to him and it has damaged his future in a way that he was trying to be healthy he was building his body and he was loving life yeah and then it just went too far and his message is, don't do it, because it took him so far back in, in that journey. And for him, stopped him having so much confidence with the ladies, which at his time, at the age that he was the last thing that he wanted to happen. So he definitely won't be doing that again. Nope. And nor should you. 
So stay healthy, stay focused. Thank you. Podcast is for informational purposes only and does not constitute medical, legal, or financial advice. The opinions expressed are the personal views of the Thrombo Watch team. If you think you may have developed a new blood clot, please speak to your healthcare provider urgently. Health related information on this podcast, including text, graphics, images, and other material, is for educational purposes only and does not substitute professional medical advice, diagnosis, or treatment. Always seek the advice of your physician or any other qualified healthcare provider with any questions you may have regarding a medical condition. If you believe you're experiencing a medical emergency, call 999 in the UK, less urgent assistance.